All right, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce two industry titans up here today. I'm very privileged to have them uh, join me on the stage to talk about what I think is probably the most important subject uh, that we will cover over these two days. Um, our first guest is the current president and CEO of Davel, Boston Coach Chauffeur Transportation Network. He's a president of the Allied Leadership Council for the GBTA. Um, just and probably a guy that has his pulse on the industry better than anybody. Please welcome Mr. Scott Solombrino. How you doing, Scott? Good boy. How are you, buddy? I'm wonderful. Thank you very much for uh, for joining us and for going through all the troubles uh, to be able to get here today. Are you getting here? Are you kidding me? I don't think it was. Fifteen below. Well, it's a little bit warmer here. Oh, I'm on. Oh, there we go. Oh, awesome. hey, I see Kevin Ellingsworth, Dougie Schwartz. Woohoo! All right, our next guest has been the publisher of LCT Magazine, the stalwart uh, running the LCT Vegas show, the LCT Leadership Summit, LCT East, and has become a dear friend of mine. And I owe her a tremendous amount of gratitude for helping us produce this wonderful event, Miss Sarah Richardson. Woo! I turned the chair. Thank you both for uh, joining me today. This is going to be, I think, a very interesting topic of discussion and something I think is really important uh, for everybody that's here. We've got the catch box ready. I know you guys have a million questions all ready to go. Um, but I'm going to open it up. And Sarah, I want to start with you first. Um, where do you see our industry in five years? Hello? Testing? There you go. All right. Um, in a nutshell, I see uh, the word mobility. Uh, you're going to hear that word a lot. Um, and mobility is um, the, the uh, cross, crossing over of all things ground transportation. So I see uh, less verticals where you're simply a luxury transportation um, product versus a courtesy transportation product, which is shuttle, and those two never intersected. And I see in five years, those two markets intersecting courtesy transportation and for hire transportation. I think that's the biggest trend that you're going to see and the biggest growth opportunity that you're going to uh, enjoy um, from here through, let's give it five years. Scott, same question. I just want to first thank Billy for inviting me to come to Nashville. I think that the work that Bill is doing for operators has very, very solid credibility. It's helpful. I think he's doing a fantastic job with the stuff he's trying to do to help operators to make more money in their businesses and help understand what your strategy should be. And so I give you a lot of credit, Bill, uh, for coming into a sector uh, that needed some help. And I think you've really done a fine job. And that's why I came here, because I want to be supportive, because without small to mid-sized operators, none of the big companies could survive. And so I am truly appreciative of what you're doing here. Thank you it's so much. It's a great much. audience and it's like a I great crowd. That. Seriously. Thank you. So right. the future, um, you know, it depends on where you sit. If you're a, a smaller operator, I think you have one perspective in the future. If you're a large, large operator, you have a whole different perspective. Uh, we're definitely in a time of transition. And I can tell you what's not going to happen. We're not going backwards in time. Um, we try to figure out every day, strategically, where we need to be positioned for when everything starts to happen. And things are going to happen. This is a year where things are going to take place. Uber and Lyft are going to try to go public in a very complicated environment. Because if they don't go public, Uber in particular is out of private equity. They're not going to give them any more money in private equity. I can tell you that. I know that. 
Lyft has bigger resources, believe it or not, than Uber, because Henry Kravitz and Kyle Icahn are two of the wealthiest men on the planet, and they are the people running Lyft. And so Lyft is much more of a threat long term than Uber is to people, certainly in the corporate market. So that's going to happen. And then what does that look like for the industry? I think after that, you're going to see the Carlyle Group attempt to go public because they need to monetize their asset at Addison Lee. Um, and they've certainly had their challenges. I think that has to happen sooner or later. Carlyle is very smart. They're not hanging around for you know, having fun and printing profits there because I can tell you that's not how it works. They're going to want to monetize some way. So I think that you're going to see a lot of change at the top. We also need to remember that Cary, who's owned by Highland Capital, another company just like Carlisle, big, deep pockets. Um, a couple of people tried to buy that, me being one of them, and couldn't get to first base with them. Um, they brought in Sandy Miller, who's a guy I've known who came from Budget Rent-A-Car. He founded Budget Rent-A-Car back in the 80s. And him and his son kind of went in and got a look-see, and now they're running the deal, and at some point I would imagine they own it. At some point they have to monetize. Well, here's the good news. While all of them are trying to monetize, what you all should be doing with your partners, and everybody should have a partner. You should be in a network. You should be in a limo anywhere. You should be in a carry, a Dave L, an Empire, uh, an Addison Lee. You need partners everywhere because the world is too complex to go alone anymore. Even I have partners with my big partnership competitors. Why? Because we have to. So while they're all out trying to monetize, which they will all try to do, you have to be out there making yourself more relevant to the customer. You got to get sticky with your own customers because nobody can take the customer away from you if the customer loves you, no matter how much money they have or how big they get. It's not relevant. Okay. We're in a, this is a personal services business. That's what we do. We're personal services. People get attached. You're not telling the chairman of IBM who's picking them up every day. I can tell you the procurement department isn't making that decision. It's not happening. They want to be sticky with people they trust who are delivering a personal service to them. And you don't have to be big. You don't have to be huge. All you have to do is be good every day. And so while all the big mega conglomerates are trying to monetize, remember one thing. Only one of them will succeed monetarily because that's how it works in the sector. Somebody's going to hit it. The rest of them are going to get shut out. There's not enough of a need in the public markets for four or five or six publicly held chauffeured car companies. Ain't going to happen. Look at the trash business. You're down to three. And pick an industry. Look at the rental car business. You're down to three. Look at the airlines. You're down to three that matter. Delta United, American. Southwest is an outlier, very successful. The rest of it's garbage, nonsense. They can come and go. JetBlue might be here, might not be here. Nobody cares. So what happens is the industries consolidate very quickly. Ground is not that big. It's not that important. So one of them is going to monetize. I don't know how it ends for the other four or five because I don't see the market supporting them. And if one of them has a hiccup and it goes bad on the offering, no one's getting paid. None of them are going to monetize. Now, how do we know that? Because history has shown us that Kerry went public 25 years ago. I was very involved in that public offering because there was only one analyst covering them, Ladenberg and Thalman out of San Francisco. And the only person he talked to every week was me because there was no one else to talk to. And so I told him everything he should know about what would work and what wouldn't work with that public offering. Guess what? They didn't stay public very long. It was a failure. Why? Because ground transportation is too hard. So I'm waiting to see how it plays out. And people like you are going to help people like them avoid all these minefields and build a better business, personal service industry, and be more successful because you don't want to get wrapped up in any of that nonsense. Nothing for you there. So let, I'm going to ask you a follow-up, Scott, um, because you talk about really the importance of your relationship and your client retention, which I've been preaching for the last few years. And I hear from a lot of people when I tell them or advise them, you know, you need to spend at minimum one hour a day if you can justify that. But they're behind the wheel. You were small at one time in 1968 when you started, I think was the year, correct? 78. 78. You're sorry. aging me, Billy uh, Sorry, Boy. I apologize. Um, you're the CEO of one of, if not the largest privately owned company in the entire ground transportation industry. I know you fly a lot. I don't know many details, but what I want to ask you is how much of your time is spent 
and building relationships and client retention to be, you say to be sticky, to be sticky. 70% of my time I'm with customers around the world. How? How do you do Simple. that? Simple. You have to have great managers, great teams of people working under you, great systems so you can monitor them. Anybody who's an affiliate in this building here that knows our system, we have an unbelievable system of customer service. Uh, at 10.30 every Friday, there's 70 managers on one phone call talking about every single thing that went wrong the week before, granular, down to the numbers, down to what percentage we're at in each market, and every one of them has to present. No one ever misses a Friday meeting. You cannot have a salesperson from Dive Elk Boston Coach see you on a Friday at 10.30 Eastern Time, because they're not available, ever. No one misses the call. They can't. If you're in senior management, you're on that call. So as long as that is going well, and I can manage those metrics every single week and know exactly what was our error ratio, what was our recovery ratio, did we lose any customers as a result of an issue, how do we respond back, what is the driver retention rate, what is the driver hiring rate, what's the training success rate. When you go through all the metrics that we look at every single week, you can run your business and spend 70% of your time running around with customers. I am in front of more customers than anybody in this business, because I know I am, because they tell me every day. They say, no one does this. And I'm talking about C-level guys, CFOs, CEOs, senior vice presidents, you name it. And people make the time for me, because they know I care, and it's personal to them, because they're using the service. Now, why do I do that? Because if I know I'm never getting fired at company A, no matter what somebody else bids, I have an advantage in the marketplace, don't I? Because I know it doesn't matter what you bid, you could bid zero you're not getting hired. Why? Relationship. People want relationships in the world that we're in. The internet has ruined the world. Everybody wants relationships. They're tired of the internet. They're tired of texting, emailing, Snapchatting, chatabating, whatever the hell else is going on out there, it's all bad. They're tired, they're overwhelmed with it. They're tired of being voyeurs into somebody else's life. They want real relationships and they want service and if you can do somebody a favor, I'll give you an example today. What happened yesterday? Anybody know what happened last night? The New England Patriots, unexpected by anybody in New England, are on their way to the Super Bowl. So what does that mean for me this morning at 6 a.m.? What do you think happened to me at 6 a.m. this morning? Every A-list clown in the city of Boston is in my email texting me or calling me saying, I need three SUVs in Atlanta, I need five cars, 25 sedans, my grandmother's coming in, and you, you got to fix it for me. My affiliate department basically started to cry today on the phone. I'm on a plane, and I'm texting them on the plane. I'm like, I need the 10 cars. Tom Brady called uh, with Giselle. They need 20 cars. I mean, it's like unbelievable. And it's Atlanta. I don't even own goddamn Atlanta. Can you imagine? That's, Anybody here? Hold on a second. I did not Chris, swear. Chris, that's $100 that's for Mr. Saul and Brino. There's no F words. Only F words count <laughs> for me. Anybody here from Atlanta? Yeah. Anybody need any business? Come see me when you're done. Because... We are melting down and out of control because the New England Patriots, for the third time in four years, are going back to the Super Bowl again, right? You have no idea the stress. The chairman of Putnam, the chairman of Fidelity. I mean, I, can, I can't even keep up with it. And everybody wants multiple things. Nobody, no one's saying, can you get me an airport transfer? I want five cars for six days. Oh, great. And we're out of cars. Like, it's craziness. So that's what happens when you maintain relationships. I don't have to wonder in my mind how many calls I'm going to get for Super Bowl, because now I know, because I know the people from Boston want to go. Now, if New England wasn't in, they weren't going. The reason anybody wants to go to this Super Bowl is they think it's Brady's last game and Belichick's last game ever. They're wrong about that, because Tom is a client forever. He's not retiring. They're wrong. He's going to keep playing, OK? I know he's going to keep playing, unless Giselle ties him up. The bottom line is, personal service, who do they call? They call me. Crazy. So that's what it takes when you want to know your customer. Your employees need to be taken care of, but your customers are paying you and the employees. They're more important than anybody. So Scott, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna come back to Sarah, but I wanna ask you one more follow-up into that, because our average fleet size that's here, the first time we've ever- I read the fleet list. Yeah, so is roughly around 22 to 23 cars. So yeah. really good medium-sized fleet list that we have. Here. I wanna congratulate all the people in this room with three cars who showed up to this event and yeah, spent who has your time under 10 cars here? And, and spent your money and took the time out of your office, you should be commended because it's making you a better operator to network with all these people. So good for those people and give them a job if you can help them. Raise your hand if you have less than 10 vehicles. 
And Look at all need, these people. If you need help, call me because I'll get you some more jobs too. Because you're the future of this business. So Scott, I think the biggest thing for that five car, seven car person, the hardest thing is to try to figure out like you had to do in 1978 to go from zero to probably half a billion dollars plus in revenue today. How do they get out from behind the wheel? They hear you say, I spend 70% of my time, but I've got 70 managers and Tom Brady this. How did they do that? Can you remember back then? Sure, I can tell you, 1978, I graduated high school, president of my class. I got accepted to Harvard. I couldn't go to Harvard because my father couldn't afford to send me, I didn't get a scholarship. So I, my mother then made me go to Boston College for an interview with Father Moon. I got accepted to Boston College, had to turn him down because at Boston College, you're required to live on campus and you couldn't have a job, not allowed with the Jesuits, no job. So I said, Father Moon, I can't come here. He was like horrified. He's like, what do you mean? We just accepted you, you gotta come here. I said, no, I can't, I gotta work. And I went to Suffolk University, which at the time was an urban school, which ended up being the best law school in New England. Funny coincidence, right? And I built my company while I was in college. So the first thing I did was hire a retired truck, neighbor, truck driver named Chick Provenzano, and he would drive my car during the day. So he'd do the funerals in the day, and then I'd do the night on the towns, and I'd study at night. And my first customer for night on the towns were a group of strippers that worked for a strip club, because on Monday night, it was industry night. You think I'm joking? My wife, who's currently my wife, used to be typing the invoice, and I'd be out driving the strippers on a Monday night. And it became a thing amongst all the strippers and bartenders in Boston. They would all call Scotty on Monday nights. And I'd have one car, two car, three cars every Monday night because that's where the business was. And they're huge tippers. They'll never make fun of girls who work in strip clubs. Huge tippers. They just want to have a good time. They would go out drinking with their friends, partying, and I'd drive them all home, and they were drunk. This is 1978. When I graduated in 1982, got accepted to law school, I had 40 cars doing $3 million a year. And my accountant says to me, you should skip law school. And I said, you're mental. I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to law school. And he said, why don't you just run the business for a year? And that's when I met David Klein, the founder of Davell, because I, I flew to New York unannounced and showed up at his office. And there's a whole story with that. The point was, I knew on day one that if I stayed behind the wheel, that I could never make as much money as I could make if I was outside of the wheel. But you have to be able to cross that path, right? You have to have people that you can depend on, that you trust, that you can train, that you feel comfortable are going to treat your customer like you would treat them. You've got to get out from, away from the wheel. That's not going to help you. You driving customers does not get you any business. You have to be available to go out every day, to go to the Rotary, to go to the Chamber of Commerce, to go to every event at night, to take on some charities in, in your business and try to develop and network with people every day. There isn't a flight that I take that I don't sell the guy sitting next to me something. Obviously, I fly first class. I've been flying United for 40 years. I'm a global services. I, don't, I, I pay for nothing. It's just mental because of all the years of flying. Hunt, millions, I have millions and millions of miles. When I sit down on that seat, I'm the first guy that says, hi, I'm Scott Sambino. Who are you? Do you know that I once flew with the managing partner of one of my biggest clients in the world, the managing partner of Boston Consulting? He looks at me and says to me, I know who you are. We spend millions with you. I can't believe you're on the flight with me. I mean, it was kind of a joke. I, I said, you got any problems? He goes, I wish I could say there's anything wrong. Nothing wrong. I mean, I will pitch anybody on a plane because you got your captive for three or four hours. Could you imagine being stuck next to me for three or four hours? <laughs> when I'm done, I'm taking your pants, your wallet, and I got your wife's home address. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, but that's what it is. You have to be interactive in this business. And then everybody's, they stay forever. I, keep in, I come back, I say, Phil, let's open these accounts. Give it to the salespeople. I now give it to my sons, they're in sales. Or, give this to Zach, give this to Anthony. The salespeople yell, them, you favor your kids. You're certainly right, I do. So I mean, but that's interaction. You have to sell. Now this one here, she could sell ice to the Eskimos and whiskey to the Indians all day long. She's a phenomenal salesperson because in her world of publishing and shows, she sells every day. I have a different style, though. I let the customer talk. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm doing what I'm doing and you're doing what you're doing. <laughs> so, I, you know, it's funny that he brings that up. I think it was either 2009 or 2010, the theme of Las Vegas when we we're in the middle of the recession was sell like hell. Yep. Do you remember that? Yep. So I believe that one of the things that we have to do to make it through the disruption that we're in is exactly what you're talking about. Sticky relationships, deeper relationships with our clients, but those that are not selling have to get out and start selling tomorrow. Um, 
you had a really awesome leadership summit in Miami. And there was a great guy there, I can't remember his name, about autonomous okay. uh, vehicles, a guy from, from the UK. Yeah. Um, but you and I have had many discussions as well, and I'm gonna let you choose what you wanna talk about. <laughs> Uh, but also the kind of non-traditional verticals, the opportunity that's out there outside of just sedans and SUVs to and from the airport. What do yeah. you see so, happening? Um, I'm a research junkie. That's what I do. I Google everything. My tombstone will have the word why. Um, and true story, um, <laughs> why I, not? Try to, <laughs> I try to be two years in front of what's happening now. Um, and just for my own strategic planning and keeping pace with all these changes. So um, I guess, I think I'm, I'm answering your question. What I see um, when we see, when we talk about verticals, you see the luxury space with our group, our own shows, our own form of communication, including the magazine and the digital and the social. You see the same thing going on at the, uh, at the, with the motor coaches. They have their own world that they live in. You see the same thing with taxi and paratransit. Um, and the beat goes on. And I said it um, a couple minutes ago, I'll say it again. There's, there's two forms of ground transportation that are intersecting. They're the for higher transportation and the courtesy, tr uh, courtesy transportation. The courtesy transportation is, is in my opinion, your golden ticket for growth. Um, courtesy transportation has its own verticals. There are retirement homes that have shuttle services. There are parking lot. There's a whole world of parking lot owners that have shuttle. Um, airport hotel properties, they have their own association. They have shuttles churches, schools, and there's, you know, and the beat goes on. But there's a whole world of courtesy transportation. I'll tell you a story. I was at Costco a couple weeks ago, and this gorgeous Sprinter comes by, and it says Heron's Point. It's a brand-new retirement community that just went in. Beautiful vehicle. I follow and go up to um, this, this facility, and they have 20 of them, brand-new. And um, I meet with the operations director and I start asking them all these questions about how they operate their fleet. And so they go out and they own these really expensive um, buses. And ironically, um, anybody that's on staff, any of the nurses um, and what have you that are on staff um, can drive the vehicles. And they're taking you know, these, these uh, 55 and olders you know, downtown to do their shopping and stuff without a CDL, without anything. And so I start imagine the nurse leaves you. Yeah, you know, you're on life so support. I I'm going to drive somebody. Be back yeah. in an hour. <laughs> it was quite remarkable. Lunatics. And what was even more remarkable was I was telling them what I do, and I said, you know, you should really be talking to my people about outsourcing the service piece of this. And they're like, the limo, limo people, they couldn't. You know, so um, interestingly enough, the word limo throws us in a vertical and, and actually closes doors um, because some of these markets are open for um, you um, and it takes getting in there and having a conversation like the one I had at Heron's Point to just kind of defuse the, um, the, the perception. I think there's an industry perception and I don't know if, if... She's been trying to change the name for years, and I, I fight her every day. We're not changing. Limo no. is, the, is the history of what we do. I understand. Forget perception. Sell harder. Well, I'm just saying you guys have to get out there, and, um, and you have to have those kind of conversations. Um, and I think that there's a big, wide, open um, world for you in the courtesy transportation marketplace. So while you guys are here, just FYI, about 17 miles south of here, uh, next to my home where I live, is Brookdale Senior Living's World Headquarters, just FYI, one of the largest, uh, mm -hmm. you know, senior living and elderly care facilities in the country. Big you wanna, money. You want to make a trip. I should have gone on that business. Exactly. 
So one of the things is about education with that, right? I mean, they don't know that they need CDLs. They don't know anything about DOT. They're almost all operating illegally. And in this environment that you're in, you have to be everything to everybody. It's a different environment. Five years ago, I would say to you, focus on what you do best. I'd say that's not what you should do today. You should try to have a franchise of, of shuttle business, a franchise of small bus business. You should try to be in as many verticals as you can because it gives you safety across those verticals. And then you excel at the one you're doing best in. But keep the others there and another, don't give up on them. So I agree with Sarah. Another, Lots of opportunity. What happened um, up to the recession is um, this industry started um, enjoying a really great life with sedans, airport runs, and, and farm out work. And into the recession, people started calling me, hey, for the first time ever, I'm coming to your show to network because I've lost 30% of my book of business. It's not coming back. It's not like they stalled budgets. My, my clients are out of business. So I have to, for the first time, open my mind up to farm and farm out work. So that became this trendy thing to do. We were still in the sedan business. 80% of our revenue streams uh, not too long ago were coming from the airport uh, transportation, uh, airport runs made up 80% of our industry's revenues. So people got into this whole networking thing. You saw the magazines build up all these ads with operators. It was kind of a phenomenon. Coming to the shows, and more, more was happening in the foyer than on the expo floor. Um, so fast forward now, I think that um, one of the things I'm seeing since we're talking about the future of the industry is um, there's not a lot of growth. There's not a ton of people entering our market. We're pretty static. Um, Scott would argue that we're shrinking. So that said, um, people know each other. There's a million events and a million opportunities. Social media has helped, but everybody knows everybody. So, you know, what I also think from a trend standpoint, from looking into the future is you know, maybe networking is, um, it's always going to be important. I don't think it's going to be as hot and heavy as that run that we had. I think everything's settled down. And I think people are starting to come full circle to the old ways of trying to monetize and find all those golden nuggets inside their market. When you have your phones blowing up all day long with um, farming work or you're hearing from all the affiliates, you really don't have a big incentive to get out there and go sell locally. You don't have to deal. You can just sit and answer phones and dispatch cars. Um, and why but, would you want to build your business? But I'm business not sure on? I agree with that. I, I think you have to have I, a I agree that you have to I have a local it, business. But I, but I also agree you need to be undercover in being part of something bigger. Yeah. Because the world has gotten too complicated. The corporations in the Fortune 1000 want to deal with one company, two companies, they're done with 100 operators. We see it every day. So you have to be in those ecosystems. I agree. And the industry is definitely shrinking because I see less and less people in business than I've seen in the last 42 years. It's just less companies, it's not more companies. So what does that mean? It means that guys like me, guys like David Seelinger, guys like Timmy Rose and Mike Fogarty, guys like Bar uh, Barry Bonnie Miller at, at Cary, we don't have enough people to circulate the supply to meet the demand. What I'm you're not, saying is you need more affiliates. No question. I'm not running 100,000 cars anytime soon of my own fleet. Why? It's just not cost efficient. It's not logical. Why am I going to open a company in Nashville, Tennessee? Look, Nashville's a lot of fun. I'll have a couple of drinks, have dinner here. I'm not opening a company in Nashville, Tennessee. Not enough residual revenue to build a business for me. So I have to depend on three people in Nashville every day to manage what I need managed. And if they can do it as good as I can do it and as efficiently as I can do it, why would I want to own it? I don't want to do that. It's not efficient. I have to go out and buy more buses, more motor coaches, more shuttles. I don't have time to worry about that every day locally. So what I would say to you is every piece of organization you can be a part of, you should be a part of, including the big software groups like Limo Anywhere, which gives you 5,000 companies to go back and forth with every day. There's a reason for these things. And you have to do it to remain competitive in this environment. If you're an island unto yourself, you're going to end up dead. I'm yeah, sorry. It's a different time. You can't be alone anymore. It's too dangerous. But you have to make sure, I would say your rule, my rule of thumb, my, my 
um, advice um, would be to watch your book of business and keep it balanced. And I saw operators getting into 70 percentiles and worse with affiliate work. And remember, that's discounted work. It may be falling right into your lap, but it, you're doing work at a discount. And one day, these my, my dear friends of the industry started waking up and realizing they're working their asses off and it's just cash flowing their business. So you gotta be really careful about not you know, uh, be becoming um, dependent on that work and treading water and really not getting anywhere. You need your own customers, you need rate card business to pull up your margins. And you, if anybody was part of my state of the industry, you're gonna hear it again. There's, there's a threshold that you have to be focused on. You have to be looking or at a 10%. Or you need to be in a global network that pays every Friday. And here's the other thing. There <laughs> is. And there's one of those out there, and it's only one. <laughs> there is. Guess who it is? There is a Woo world. <laughs> there is a world. There are people in I this industry. I didn't say that 10 years ago. <laughs> there are people in this industry that no matter how much Scott preaches or I nag or Bill um, speaks to, they're not going to be. Um, they're not going to go out there and make the sale. They're not salespeople. They're, we have our share of introverts in this industry, and there are people that are perfectly happy with white labeling and working for affiliates. And I think that that's something that you know uh, is um, a business model in and of itself that you can actually survive and maybe thrive on being a white label. But I don't, I, I really think you have to know what you're doing. So I, I would just, I agree and disagree with both of them. I would be Ooh. careful about leveraging too heavily, you know, in the 90th percentile. But I think you also do need to be involved in the affiliate networks as well. And not here to sell for Scott, but I don't know of anybody that's paying every Friday besides you guys. Friday. Right you get the um, number, right? Doesn't I know there's going to be a million questions. We are halfway Mon through this session. So I'm going to open it up to uh, some questions for Scott and Sarah. Oh, we got questions. You can ask question you want I don't care how do you like that who's gonna be the first question come on make it a good one nothing's off the table oh we got a man right here in the front with a nice hat I like the lid all right we'll come right up here after the, she's got it back there Maria. Uh -oh. okay uh, I'm Maria Priestley and I'm in Atlanta hello oh. and I wanted to ask you a question over all of the time that you are have been in business, if you what can you tell me today? Um, I want to ask you a couple of things. What is the 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 advice that you give to small operators like that, like us, of the biggest learning when you started your business that can impact the future of your company? I can let you answer that, and then I can ask you the second one. You have to be something different and unique that no one else is being in that market to get that customer to sticky and be stick with you. So every day when you wake up, you have to say to yourself, how do I reinvent what I'm doing? Anybody can drive somebody to an airport. It's how you execute that that determines how sticky the customer stays. I tell people it's always the simple things, right? If in our core standards, we use two newspapers, the Wall Street Journal and New York Post. It's a Murdoch thing. We friends with the Murdochs, that's the way it is. We use one brand of water. It has to be a recognized brand. Don't put water from your local town that has a label on it. And never put your company name on the water. Remember, anybody tells you in marketing, stupid, because people like me would never drink that water. Never. I say, that's stupid. He's doing it in his house. Not, don't do it. It's not what you want to market. You want to brand in other ways. But you have to be unique. So we put specialty wipes that you can only get if you're in the back of our cars. We put specialty candy because some people want candy. We put things that we think make us different, and then we execute it with Richie's standards, with the chauffeur saying the exact same thing every time you get in one of our vehicles, repeated, 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 every time. And you know what people say? I know exactly what I'm gonna get for a product line. So you have to find that sweet spot for your business. Because if you're not different, why am I gonna call you? I'll use you Monday, him Tuesday, her Wednesday. It's never about the price. That's my suggestion to all of you. People think it's about price. I say it's never about price. If I'm wealthy enough to use a chauffeured car every day, price is not my issue. 
I got bigger problems. My airline ticket costs twenty thousand dollars. No one cares about two hundred dollars to spend to go to the airport. People don't care about price as much as people think they do. If you've attracted the right end user customer, you have to find where your sweet spot is with your customer. And once you get one, never let them go, or her. Awesome. Let's come up here to Ronnie, Maria. If we get a chance, we'll come back. We just I got a lot see of you. people. That's why I stood up. Ronnie Ramides from Shreveport. Beautiful hat. Thank you. Well, uh, just given what Sarah said and what Scott just said, I was going to see about uh, Scott, uh, us uh, all getting a little bit of an increase in our airport transfers. <laughs> <laughs> you said nothing was off limits, Scott. No, that was just a joke to break the ice from her. <laughs> hey, there's always one in the room. <laughs> Who else? Come on. Well, while they're passing that around, I'm going to make a comment on one of the things that um, uh, I, I deal with on the phone. People call all the time. Uh, I deal with a lot of startups and small operator questions. And one of the things, um, this question comes up all the time. And I'm going to say to you guys, know your market. Um, I can't tell you how many people buy product, get themselves into you know, um, the wrong vehicles um they go out and put their 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 fleet together first don't do that know who your customers are and what they want so do your research it's it's um it's it's the difference of surviving and not surviving i um have a um good friend of mine that's a, a small operator in the midwest and they ran out and got a vehicle that they didn't have um a customer for and they're sitting on a very expensive mortgage payment trying to figure out how to get the customers in the vehicle so if I could say one thing that comes across my desk that's scary that happens to a lot of operators is they rush out and they decide what they want to put in their fleet first and then they figure out what their market will bear second it's the number one question well, I did the other thing well. I want to say is that you got to look the part I want to buy things from people that look like I want them to look so of all the people in this room, I'm only buying from one guy today, it's the guy right there. I don't even know who he is. Have I met you before? I'm a little slow, don't mind me. He looks the part. Ned he Johnson from Gretsch He Motors. looks like a CEO. He's dressed, his tie matches his pocket square, he looks impeccable, he has a nice haircut. I wanna buy something from him because this is the chauffeured car meeting. That's the way I look at the world, right? So I asked Billy before I came, because I did a, a gig in Long Island two weeks ago on a cold winter night in Long Island for Doug Schwartz, one of the great people in the world. He's sitting right there. He founded a new association. I'm there to support him to the end. Phenomenal guy. And I said to Dougie, Doug, I'm coming down, but can I be casual? Because I just got off a five week vacation. I haven't put a suit on yet, and I'm a little bit traumatized. I literally got on the plane. I said, oh my God. I go down and I was casual. And after I left that meeting, I kind of said, maybe that was the wrong image I should have given to those people who just started this association. It's very successful. You got to look the part. Why would I give anybody else business in this room? I'm going to give him business because he looks the part, right? I know it's a casual meeting, but you get my point. There's nothing wrong. With, by the way, suits are back. Big Wall Street Journal story this week. Suits are back all over the place. People want to be dressed and in suits young successful people back in suits and ties and what did you and i talk about when we talked about the billy the said code? to me come as you should normally come to a meeting and i said you know what i'm putting black on because i put on about five pounds over the holidays it's an italian thing not good to represent your company to brand and your personal to brand. represent your brand right you gotta look the part don't think you you live you live in silicon valley because even those idiots are wearing suits now <laughs> they really are i was just out there Shocking. They're all putting suits on. Oh, we have a question from the famous and huge supporter of the National Limousine Association, the New England Livery Association, the GCLA Association in LA, the New Jersey Association. He's in more associations than I am, and I founded half of them. Jeff Broadsley, <laughs> the man of the hour. Oh, I don't have a question now. Scott plugged me. That's great. Um, all right, so I'm a big believer in what both of you guys were saying with respect to like creating verticals. Obviously, I've done that in my business. This is one of them. I have a ton of verticals that we're a part of, and this is only one. And, and I, 
Uh, I've been saying that to limo operators for a while, and I'm glad to hear both of you guys as icons in the industry share that. So I want to actually like encourage that as well as living proof. You guys all know me in this room as limo, but we're extremely successful in various verticals. Um, Uber has smashed you guys kind of hard, not as hard as you might have thought, but smashed me as well because I make money every time you guys process a credit card. So my revenues went down. If I wasn't verticalized and I wasn't big in jewelry or funeral care or, or hospitality or whatever it may be, my, my revenues would have been impacted massively. So with that, I, I third, what they're saying is don't just be retail, don't just be corporate, go after big events, so on and so forth, do shuttle buses. With that, Sarah, you talk to everybody, anyone in the industry, Scott, you do business with everyone, anyone in the industry. What would you leave these folks with? What area is, are you seeing the largest growth in to start attacking into if they haven't otherwise been there? Courtesy shuttle. Courtesy shuttle. Courtesy shuttle is really opened up Everybody wants convenience. They're giving shuttles for everything. It's crazy. I see it all day long. And, and that, so that changes the trajectory of, of your sale because that's a, that's a, that's a, uh, a contract sale. It's reoccurring revenue. It comes in every month. I'll tell you a goofy story. Right next to my headquarters in Boston, there was this dilapidated piece of real estate. It was a mess. Three people went to jail over it. Everybody tried to develop it. They kept getting indicted. People went to prison. Finally, one group comes in, and they build this monstrosity apartment complex. We were, like, horrified. Like, oh, my God, they're going to bring in a million people. This sucks. And literally, I look out my conference window, and I'm looking at this big gray monstrosity. So I said to one of the sales guys, I said, I bet they need shuttles over there. Go over there and sell a deal to go to the, the train station across the, sh the train stations around the corner. Sure enough, we get a multi-year yeah. contract we have vans every day across from our front door driving the people who live in the building. Majority of the building, guess what, is stewardesses and captains of airlines. Weird, huh? We shuttle them to the train and bus station. That's how they get to the airport. Crazy, right? They live here, though. They're not on crew business. This is non-crew business. This is where they live. They're going to work. Then they get picked up for the crew business when they go to the next city. Across from my office, all day long. Who would ever thought? We're making thousands of dollars. Now I laugh and say, oh, I'm glad that building's there. <laughs> I mean, I swear to God, but that, that's what you got to do. You got to find things you never would think of. Yes, we have a question from. Look up, uh, look up non emergency medical transportation. Huge growth market. Look up um, airport uh, parking properties. There's an association. I had dinner with um, a guy, 28 year old. Um, running 250 shuttles for Ace Parking, a family-run, privately-held parking company um, in San Diego. They tur It turns out they also own all the valets up and down the coast. 250 vehicles, and he's operating these things. And when, when, when I say courtesy transportation, courtesy transportation is an extension of somebody's core business. So it's not getting a lot of thought. Um, it's something that they have to provide as an extension of their core business. And that it makes it perfect for you guys to go in there because it's a hassle factor for them. And they might own the vehicles and just um, contract the labor, the maintenance, and the, and, the, and the fleet management. Or they may want uh, nothing to do with any part of it and hire you and outsource the entire kit and caboodle. But, um, you know, once you guys, this industry provides a service on wheels. I was at the United Motor Coach Association a couple weeks ago, and it was hilarious because we're the big disruptors. All they talk about are the limo people are here. And we've moved into the bus market. Eric knows he was there. Um, and they are um, hunkering down in their little motor coach world and, you know, stay away, stay away, you bad limo people and at, in the in their conferences they're talking about how um how the limo people how why they're scared they're scared because our service levels are are just beyond their comprehension and um you know, ever find a bus company that didn't have a bus driver nothing worse than a bus driver like they're the worst their idea right? of service they don't get out of the bus <laughs> They're all overweight. They shouldn't pass the health test. They still get the job anyway. They sit there and they complain, and they, all they want to do is drive the bus. If any change, they're not doing it. Horrifying, right? So you talk about that's why it's so easy yeah. for chauffeured car people 
to win the bus business. We put the guy in a suit and tie. He has real training. He understands how to drive the bus, how to talk to the customers. Bus drivers don't do that. They never have. They hate us. They don't like us. Bill was talking about earlier um, scaling your business. And this is a perfect example. You guys have figured out how to provide a service on a rolling piece of equipment. That's all it is. It's a service on wheels. And you can take that and blueprint it and, and, and stick it into all these other verticals. But you need to know what your verticals are in, in each given market. You might live in New England and be, you know, in the world of, of universities. And it might all be collegiate contracts for you. It might be down in Florida and you're in the sea of retirement city communities. And it might be retirement is, is the thing for you. So know what, what your market can monetize. Eric Devlin had his hand up for a long time. And he's from Dallas. How are the Cowboys doing? <laughs> Go ahead. I have a very firm opinion on this. One of my largest clients in the world was an airline called Emirates. We did $16 million a year with Emirates for 14 years. They came to me and said, we want you to drop your price by 40%. And first, it started with the junior guys. And I said, yeah, that would be no. Uh, we're not dropping our price, actually, we're raising our rates. Sorry, no. So then they went to the next level. And finally, it went to the president of North America who said, we love you. We're getting pressure. It's a price issue. The airline business is terrible. you got to do this. And I'm like, we will die first. You're disruptive. You're a pain in the ass. Not happening. So then I get the call from Dubai. So they stop. And by, everybody in Dubai is British, by the way. They're all British or Australians. There's nobody in Dubai who lives in Dubai who's from Dubai that works. They don't work. Okay. The Brits and the Australians run Dubai and do all the work. The guy says, hey, hello, blah, 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 blah. you know, we'll increase your business by 10 million. We'll give you 35 million. I said, you can give me 150 million. The price is not going down. We're not giving you a 40% discount. Your contract expires on November 1st. And on November 1st, we either have a deal or we're done. And your thousands of people better have somebody else to drive with because we're not giving you a price thing. Then I got a call from the chairman because we drive them. And I'm like, what part of no is not getting to everybody there? We're done with you, no price decrease, not doing it, and we walked away. And people in the company were like, you can't walk away from $16 million. I said, well, guess what, we just did. We fired them, you're done. And it's been a shit show ever since, it's been a disaster for them. But guess what, they're still stuck on price. So they're buying it from somebody else for 40% less than I was selling it, and they can't get the service levels, but they don't care because they're saving the 40%. So there's an instance where the price was more important than the quality of the service. But I don't really care, because I went out and replaced that business within four months. Took a while. Replaced it with other business, higher rated business. And I'm happier, because I don't have that nightmare of having to have 70 cars at two o'clock at Kennedy Airport, you know, at, at, or 80 cars at 6 a.m. at Newark. It's like, <clears throat> who cares? Let somebody else do it. We're not gonna give it away for free. I Here. wasn't gonna screw my affiliates. That's just wrong. So he basically said no. So at some point, Eric, you have to know where the line is because there might not be somebody after you that will do it for cheaper at some point because they've all gone out of business. Because you and I both know if you underbid, you'll eventually get into financial trouble and have a problem. So I say hold the pricing, see what, how it shakes out, and hope that people will come to their senses and pay a reasonable price for that type of service. And sometimes you've got to have really a pretty big set of balls and say, no, no is no, we're not doing it. So Scott, you don't take on a mentality like a lot of people in our industry do of, I gotta take on the business just to keep my chauffeurs busy? Are you kidding me? That's absurd. It's crazy. Eric. It's crazy talk. No. Let me you add. You do business because everybody makes money. We pay our people 
a lot of money. We have pension plans, health insurance plans, all kinds of plans. It all costs money. So why would I do that? For what? To keep people employed? So, okay. No. I'm, I have something to say. You do? <laughs> you're going to have, um, uh, uh, as the pioneer, you're going to have uh, some educational challenges. You're going to need to sit, try to get meetings with these people and educate them on what they're buying. Because the shuttle market has been plagued with, um, it's been a low bid, um, and they're, so they're, they're automatically trained to think in terms of, you know, what's, what, where do they even get the $60, you know? So, somewhere along the line, that, that's just a nebulous number. So instead of saying, hey, we know, we, you know, um, that we, we, that's ridiculous, get in there and have a meeting Show them what your overhead looks like. Have some transparency. Educate them on what a real ground transportation company takes on, the, the insurance that you guys Duty take of care. On. Duty of care. You're not going to kill the passengers because they're going to get sued when you do when they do when you kill non -contracted them. Non-contracted right? employees. Um, yeah, you got to so, fight. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're going to talk to operators. I know Gary uh, uh, Bauer, um, when he got the Google account, went through a lot of um, – educational pains to get people to understand the pricing model of our industry. Well, yeah. But I mean, there's an old trick, a, Eric. <laughs> you, you get them in on some rate, and then you put escalators in the contracts, and you start to sneak those rates up. Before they know it, you're back at full rate again. I mean, you got to play the game with. Escalators. As long so, as as long as I get my percentage, you can do whatever you want. So, Eric, I think one of the lessons for everybody in the room is one: you, I know you know your operating cost. So, if they want you to go to sixty, and your operating cost is fifty-six, and you're fine with a four-dollar profit margin per hour running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, then sign the contract. But if they want to be at 60 and your operating cost is 62 and you have 10 cars, I'm probably not going to advise you to sign that contract. So you got to know your operating costs. You got to know your gross profit margin. And at the and very least, you got to have fuel escalators because, you know, fuel is political and anything can happen. I mean, you got to really pay attention to the details. And there's other ways to nickel and dime people in contracts. I mean, you become an expert at it if you do a couple of them, right? There's, there's other ways to charge things to help you get more margin out of the deal. You just have to be creative. It's not always in the top line rate. There's places to put stuff. I'm a big believer in surcharges and extra charges and your sister's charges. I mean, <laughs> you know, somebody, the guys at Black Lane, those clowns, they actually did a session once at a GBTA and they, they get into trouble about the lack of transparency in the chauffeur car industry. What a bunch of dopes. I sat there and I basically cut them up and I basically said, you think the airlines have transparency? Good luck getting transparency. Ask where your taxes go for the airline reserve and where that money's sitting. What are you kidding? Try to go to a hotel. How many taxes on a New York City hotel bill? If you can figure out where all that money's going, let me know because I, I go to New York constantly. I can't tell you what it is. I just add 50% on whatever the price they quoted me is. <laughs> no, I'm not even joking. The city tax, the local tax, the hotel tax, the union tax. It's like it's, it's insane. So at the end of the day, you can find creative ways to charge. And there's nothing wrong with that when you're building a business and you're trying to keep people employed and you're doing the right things. As long as you're, you're telling the customer what you're doing. I if agree. they accept it, they accept it. They don't accept it, they don't. And, question and, over here to the right. Okay. My oh, second my question. Girl again. A follow up question. Hi. Hello. My second question is, what would you say is the biggest learning lesson that you had over the years? Um, in the chauffeur business, it takes one person to do a transaction. You can't do a transaction on your own. Somebody has to do the transaction. It actually takes two and a half people if you count the res process and the accounting of it all. You got to take care of your people and you have to train your people nonstop every minute of every day, retrain, recertify, re-re-retrain again and again and again. Because without those people, you have nothing. You're not selling cars, you're selling chauffeured services, i.e. the chauffeur is the single most important asset that you have. You have to take care of chauffeurs 
and you're in, the, you're in the best unemployment market in the history of the world. You're three and a half percent. For all the people who don't like Donald Trump, you know, go shit in your hat. The lowest unemployment rate in history, the lowest black unemployment rate in history, the lowest Hispanic unemployment rate in history, the lowest unemployment rate for women in history, and all the crazy broads protesting yesterday, we hate Trump. Yeah, you, you don't have a job because of him, you lunatics. Crazy people. They're out of control with it. Lowest unemployment rate in history. And you know what that means? It's twice as hard for you to go out and attract and keep a qualified chauffeur in this environment because they have other options. Anybody can get a job. You can be crazy and get a job today. How do you, how do you, so what are you doing? I think one of the biggest struggles out there is chauffeur recruiting. What do you we guys do? We have massive insurance retention programs. We have guys that are making tens of thousands of dollars a year because they don't have any accidents. They're accident-free for 190,000 hours on the road. I mean, if you saw some of the statistics, they're mind-boggling. And I write those checks, and I write them happily. Why? Because it was a clever way that I got something, and they got something more. So those guys are making it, more than 12 to $15 an hour plus they, grant? They are making so much money, it's like really crazy. And if you're in New York City and you're a chauffeur, give me a break. That's almost a six-figure job now in New York. I mean, if you work 80 hours in New York, you're making 100 grand a year. Are you kidding me? Those are real jobs with real benefits. And they're not contractors, they're employees. So they're paying FUTA, FICA, Medicare, state taxes, city taxes. They're important to the economy, which is why we're fighting to get the cap lifted in New York, because that idiotic mayor, who's a total moron, put a cap on everybody, Uber lifting us too. So I can't add one car in the TLC till the cap is lifted, because they wanted to stop congestion with Uber. How crazy is he? Uber doesn't have real employees. They're contractors. They make $3. They don't make any money. They're not contributing to the roads of the system. My chauffeurs pay real local taxes and federal taxes because they're employees. You have to fight to find the right employees in this environment. Very difficult environment, and it's only going to get a little bit worse before it gets better. I would say don't let your good people leave you. Retain them and find out from your employees because they will tell you what they want from their employer. It's not always about and money, it's is not, it? It's usually not about money. Um, it's never so about money. That's the joke. So keep your people, but bring them close to you, talk to them, and find out what their sweet spots are. You might find that it's just somebody that wants to get off of work on, on you know, at a certain time of day to go work out. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you never know until you get to know your people and Ask bring them, them. in surveys, talk to them, meet with them, well, this, buy this them group, pizza. This group has the luxury of um, being boutique enough where you can just bring them and sit them down. Does so anybody, have, anybody have more than 50 cars in their fleet? Yeah. 50? Okay. Oh, so, I see Tracy back there. Tracy. Tracy, have, have Sal, you a job Eric, yet? Dave, who else has over 50? Emily, North Point, Kathy. Yeah, we probably got North Point. Is to Tony 10. here? Where's Tony? He's getting ready for Super Bowl. Another thing, right. another thing I'll add to you to um, keep your people happy, and uh, and they will refer business. Give them incentives to go um, help recruit because it's better to get somebody that really loves working for you out there bringing people in. They're teed up already than it would be from an Indeed ad. In a I I agree with stranger. you. 100%. That was two great questions. What city are you in? Atlanta. Atlanta. Oh, I'm going to give you a job. All right, so we got a question online. This will be our last online question uh -oh. as we wrap up. Um, we have to wrap up? Well, we can go for a few more minutes, but we got a dinner we got to go to. Where are we going? Scott, this is for you. What do you recommend companies do to combat the rise in minimum wage? Can you address that with clients that are contracted? Listen, minimum wage, <laughs> liberalism is going to ruin this country. They think everybody should be making $25 an hour, that, and then people hire less people. There was a story yesterday in the New York Post. I read five papers a day. The Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post, the Boston Herald, and the Boston Globe every day. There's a story yesterday, a massive restaurant in New York cut its staff in half when the unemployment rate, went, when the minimum wage went to 15 bucks an hour in New York. Because they said, we can't afford to have that many dishwashers washing dishes. So what are they going to do? They're going to automate that position sooner or later, and a job is going to be eliminated. So this is where government goes crazy. They think they're helping people. They're hurting people because they're making the minimum wage in California and New York. And California is, is mental. That's a mental state. You've got a screwball governor now, another nut. You know, they want to pay double time, overtime, and time on top of the time. 
And then if you don't like working, you sue them anyway and you get more time. It's like crazy. You have to fight by being able to have some flexibility in raising your rates because if minimum wage is going up, to me, it's an automatic rate increase. How are you not going to raise your rates if the cost of your drivers just went up exponentially? That's why nobody wants to do business in California. California is going to die. As so, a Scott, state. can you elaborate on that? When you say raise your rates, are you talking about adding, you know, a dollar fifty surcharge, you adding your base rate? How you, do you? How would you? I'd do add that? it any way you could get away with it. I'd add it on the surcharge. I'd add it on the base rate. I'd add it whatever you could add. It. If you want to get clever, you add it on the surcharge because the driver doesn't get a piece of the surcharge, right? So there's a way to get around having to pay the driver more than the minimum wage. But you have to change your structure if your local minimum wage is going up. Now, the federal wage is seven seven fifty or something. It hasn't moved because the feds don't move the rate. But California, Massachusetts, Illinois, Cal and, and New York, it's bizarre. We're heading to $20 an hour for minimum wage jobs. And that means high school kids who should be working in the convenience store in the car wash are going to get $20 an hour. Does that make any sense? Those are entry-level jobs. It's called entry-level for a reason because you're teaching people how to work in the workforce. And then you're supposed to move on to the next job. How do you move on from the $20 an hour job you know, bagging groceries, why would you leave? You bag groceries, you'll be there for 20 years. It's not helpful to the economy. It stifles economies. I think it's a big mistake. They're overdoing it at the state level, and they're forcing employees, employers, to cut the number of people that work for them. For the person who wrote in, raise your rates. You have no choice. That's a great answer. I really appreciate that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's after 5 o'clock. How about a big round of well, applause? Well, I have one more Mr. question. Oh, oh. Wait a minute. Before we leave... I want to know, and then you can clap, how many people in the room are members of the National Limousine Association right now? Don't lie, because I'll look it up. I know you. Looks we like need, about 90%. We need, we need your help. We have major initiatives going on. There's been a bunch of cases at the Supreme Court that are now going to go after Uber and Lyft. There's a case in California at the Supreme Court that already went after Uber and Lyft. All this is coming to a head. We need more people, so please join the NLA if you're not a member. But now La Bill can close Ladies it. and gentlemen, I don't know how well you know Scott Solombrino. He's a polarizing personality similar to mine. But I'll tell you one thing. I don't know one person in our industry that fights harder and spends more of his own personal time than this gentleman fighting for you guys on his personal time outside of what he serves from the NLA. Scott, it's a privilege to have you here. Thank you very much. Sarah, thank you so much for everything that you've done in LCT and for being here. Phenomenal session.